Welcome to another episode of Cancer Specialist Medical Minute. With Dr. Rick and Dr. Danny. That's Rick. And that's Danny, and we are excited to be back for a special episode. And Rick, it's time for that dad joke again. As I scroll through my pages here, and it is sports week, folks. Uh, It's always sports week on this podcast. What do bears call campers in their sleeping bags? Got me. What is it? Soft tacos. (laughs) You could do better. <laughs> I feel like there's better. All right, one. I have one more, one more for bad. you. Come on. Give me a good one. Why can't you play sports in the jungle? I'm not sure. Too many cheetahs. <laughs> it's better. Thank you. All right, Rick. Well, welcome to the second part of our two-part series on research. And last episode, I think we were hyping up a very special guest, and I think we managed to secure one. That's right, Rick. Our amazing research manager, Mary Alice Anderson, is here with us at the pod loft, and we really send her a warm shout out and welcome here. Well, welcome, Mary Alice, and uh, introduce yourself. Tell us a little about yourself and how you came into this position. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. I'm really honored to be on your podcast and to talk a little bit about research. So... I am a pharmacist by training. I did undergrad at UF, and then I did pharmacy school at UF, so double Gators. I knew I liked you. Go Gator. Go Gator. Can I get a go Gator? Uh, really excited no. for next Saturday. <laughs> We're okay. so close to see the season starting. It's almost here. So um, then I did retail for a little bit, and then I actually, I like to say I did my time. I was a pharmacist in our specialty pharmacy for a year. I got to know the lay of the land, and then in March of this year, I was promoted to the research manager, and I think I've found my forever home. I come from a family of researchers, so my grandfather was a founding member of Baptist. Uh, He was a pulmonologist, and he used to do research when no one did research, so he used to spend every Thursday just dedicated to research in his lab, Uh, and so he recently passed in... February uh, from COVID, but I feel like I kind of, I remember him a lot of times when I'm doing research. So it's something that's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, He's published in over a hundred articles throughout his career, including at Nature. That's amazing. Wow. So yeah, small little journal (laughs) called Nature. Yeah. (laughs) You may have heard of it. (laughs) Uh, And then actually my uncle, uh, he's the one who really got me involved in research. He was a community oncologist um, in Monroe, Louisiana, and he sold his practice, and then he went back and got a master's at Tulane in epidemiology, and he uh, served the rest of his career at the NIH in epidemiology, and so he had me come up for a summer uh, doing a lot of population-based research, and through that, I was able, when I was an undergrad, I worked with the College of Medicine doing a lot of uh, patient-related health outcomes, so... I'm very passionate about research. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's an amazing background. <laughs> what brought you to pharmacy initially? I didn't want to be a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, UF, I mean, you can, you understand this. UF is so cutthroat in pre-med. It's like they're looking for ways to weed you out. And it just wasn't the right fit. Um, and I really like pharmacy. I like to think of us kind of as the stagehands of healthcare. So we don't need the spotlight. You, you physicians can have that. Uh, but <laughs> You know that me being part of this podcast was not my idea, right? Like I was <laughs> dragged kicking and screaming. The spotlight is That's the last. That's a lie. Oh, no, yeah, it's not. I think Rick likes the spotlight. I think they suggested it at a meeting, yeah. the two of them. Yeah. Uh, I think you guys are doing a great job. Anyway, I'm just and saying. And Rick and Danny that. just sounded the best out of all of our physician names. I'm going to be honest with you. Okay, it was our names. That's, that's what it was. <laughs> well, you guys right. can be the lead actors. I don't need to be the lead actor. Uh, now I just feel gross. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so it's like the pharmacist. I think that we have, we're the stagehands. We help with the props. We, um, we kind of help direct sometimes the lead actors to make sure they're in the right spot. So I almost viewed you guys as also more of a safety net in the sense too. that you're catching things that either we may know intuitively but don't put together or you're picking up on our mistakes where maybe we didn't mean to write, a, you know, especially on the inpatient setting, didn't mean to write for a certain drug or a certain dose. Mm-hmm. And I think it's you're kind of 
keeping everyone in line too, in addition oh. to what you were mm-hmm. saying. No, absolutely. I, I, I also, pharmacy for me was just, it, you can pull in research too. So a lot of drug information research, uh, a lot of guidelines and I don't necessarily have to make the decision. I just have to support the decision or make another recommendation. Um, And then I also really like that we get the whole picture. So, you know, we're keeping in mind comorbidities, diabetic medications, um, you know, antihypertensives. And I think our physicians are all great at um, keeping comorbidities in line, but a lot of times we have more experience with some of those medications, and especially from retail. Um, I uh, saw a lot of those top mover type of medications. So we all end up in the place we need to be at somehow. <laughs> yeah, I, I think supporting us and uh, making sure we're making good decisions in terms of drug interactions and mm. making sure that <laughs> we don't make a patient sicker with the medications we use. You're, you're yeah. really looking out for us in the best interests of the patient. So we try. <laughs> you are. Well, yeah. I think it's good that, you know, especially now in your current role, you have an, the medical background to at least synthesize and understand what these some of these trials are actually looking for, what these mm-hmm. drugs are testing. Mm-hmm. So you can get a sense of almost, a, am sure, like a BS meter to know, <laughs> okay, what, what trial is worth pursuing versus what is not. You know, obviously we, our input as physicians is part of it, but you know, you on the front end, I think makes a big difference when we're trying to figure out what trials it makes sense to open. Oh, I, I, I am so grateful for my past experience, especially, and you know, I think when we go more into research and what a clinical trial kind of looks like, we can talk more about it, but I, I know for a fact my previous experience as a pharmacist for CT, CAE grading, those adverse event grading, I'm um, mm-hmm. keeping those in mind because And I tell my team this all the time, the physicians, their idea of clinical significance may be different than what the study. Sometimes our physicians see crazy numbers and to them that's clinically significant, but having a number just slightly out of range, that may be important for the study because we're trying to understand how the drug works for patients. They, our physicians may not have that in the front forefront of their mind because they're used to seeing some crazy numbers. So um, having my pharmacy background has been really helpful for making sure we aren't missing any of those um, you know, adverse events so that we can make sure we're giving really accurate data to the sponsor. Mm-hmm. It's catching safety flags you know, that come mm-hmm. up and you know, there might be a, a elevated transaminase, one of the right. liver enzymes that we kind of brush off as right. not a big deal, but it, it can be a big deal. And uh, you're right, the, you know, the sponsors look at that closely and, and we're doing the right thing for our patient for making sure that we address it. Absolutely. And, you know, their just interpretation is a lot stricter right. than as clinicians. So yeah. that was very interesting. Well, I think, you know, we, we touched a little bit about the research process last episode, the phases and what we do here at CSNF kind of high level stuff, but Mary Alice, give us your, give the listeners kind of your take on the research program here at Cancer Specialist. Maybe you can get into some of the more the nitty gritty than, you know, Danny and I kind of glossed over some of the big picture stuff. So absolutely. I'd love to talk about our research program, but before Uh we do that, I have questions for you guys. So I like to do this for my team and it's to help kind of remind us of why do we do what we do? So you both are amazing contributors to my to our research committee, and I know that research is very near and dear to your hearts. And you alluded to in the last episode, you don't get academic days. So <laughs> your time, you're volunteering to research. So why do you do that? Why do you why are you both so passionate about research? What's your why? Well, my answer to that is that, you know, the I think the trials that we can bring patients here at Cancer Specialists and other locations um, are are essential to one add to the add to the literature and the knowledge we have about how different drugs uh, work for specific diseases and ultimately aiming to help patients uh, do better with with their cancer diagnosis either live longer or or have a better uh, maybe side effect profile that may help them live a better quality of life. So it's, you know, anytime you do a trial, I, I 
I like being involved in it because we're aiming to help patients either help them feel better or helping them live longer. Um, and you know, I I find it very fascinating to review protocols and learn about the new uh, drug mechanisms of action and kind of figure out what are the latest and greatest you know treatments we have available for you know different types of cancer that we treat in clinic. And I think it's amazing that we can bring in some of these national trials and international trials um, here in a small, it's not small, but it's a community setting. And we have just fantastic trials that I think um, sometimes you can't find anywhere else. And, you know, I, I, I'm proud to be a part of that. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of similar sentiments. But, you know, for me, I thought a lot of the medical research that was being done, especially in the oncology space, a lot of it was very not getting at those things with, you know, are we increasing survival or are we improving patients' quality of life? Because in my opinion, if you're not doing one of those two things, then really what are we doing here? So I think my passion for research is more just trying to make sure that as a community practice, we really try to emphasize those trials that actually will make a meaningful difference in patients' lives versus just doing things because we're trying to, you know, people are trying to pad a CV or you're trying to... Um, you know, make something work, you know, that probably shouldn't be tested because it's already proven not to work. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is my motivation for doing it is just trying not to waste patients time going down rabbit holes and studies that, you know, in my opinion, might be the wrong thing to do. So just being a part of the committee that helps determine which protocols to open and being a part of that, I think is, um, it's worth, it's worth the extra time uh, devoted to it. But yeah, it would be nice mm -hmm. to have some academic time. <laughs> yeah. Well, what we do, it's lifetime learning. We're learning all of the time. And every, every time you read a protocol, even if you don't read the whole thing, you're learning something. We're right. learning about new drugs. We're learning I mean, I don't know how stuff. I don't know how it was for you in training. One of the best ways I would learn about any disease site, you read the introduction to the clinical trial. And it kind of right. gives you the history lesson of how we got to this point where we're at and then you know, mm -hmm. you don't even have to read what the trial is, but it gives you a nice background as to how we got to where we are. And so, yeah. you know, I think that's that's key because, you know, unfortunately there's a lot of, you know, research that's done that I don't think advances the field really. Yeah. It's just kind of research to do research. And that's what I didn't like about, you know, some of academia. So I think in a community setting we can really focus on what are the studies that actually is going to translate, like I said, to either improving somebody's quality of life or improving improving length of life. And so I think that, right. you know, that we're in a unique opportunity here to do that. Well, very well said. And uh, you guys are the reason I love my job. Those were, um, those were just you know chilling uh, reasons that you're so passionate about research. And um, it's pretty incredible that I get to come in every day and help support a team of physicians that have really similar views and values on research and the importance of it. So you guys make my job well, fun. Don't so sell yourself you. short and the research team short because <laughs> without academic time, this would not be doable without a great team behind us that really you tee things up to make it as easy as possible for us. So I think just noticing that is the difference between other places and here is sort of, you know, a lot of the things that, we don't have time to do or taking care of for us so we can focus on, you know, the patient in front of us and, and right. what, what the meaningful things are. Absolutely. Um, so going into now, I think that's a great segue into who are, who is on our team. So mm -hmm. we have a research department and has 13 members, including myself. Uh, I act as the study pharmacist. Uh, we have a regulatory team and then we have a team of clinical research coordinators. Uh, and so the coordinators, they really do so much. Uh, they coordinate everything from uh, consenting a patient, uh, scheduling study assessments, working with the physician, working with the patient. Uh, so those coordinators, if you interact with one, they are, it is a labor of love. They really are juggling a lot. And um, they, the team has been doing, I think, a great job especially as we're growing. So um, mm -hmm. it's really awesome to help manage them and uh, support them. And I think the, the amount of sites, you know, we, oh we have gosh. You yeah. know, research coordinators bouncing from site to site, and, and they really do a great job at 
you know, getting to a certain location, if a patient needs to be consented or we need to um, just review a study with a new patient, I think they do an amazing job. So I just want to re- reiterate that. Yeah, they, uh, it's, a, it's a great team. I, they teach me things all the time. I think I learn something new from them every single day. And that's another reason just my job is awesome. Uh, we have the research director, Dr. Mosey. I think that uh, I took his spot <laughs> due to some scheduling. <laughs> I don't. I think what actually happened was Brenna said she didn't have enough hard drive to store all of what Dr. Mosey had said, <laughs> and the episode would go on for too many uh, hours. So. Can we edit that out? <laughs> we can leave it in. He we do it. want he him on it. for a future episode, by yeah. the way, Dr. Mosey. That'll We're be a five-parter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It'll be its own podcast. I mean, <laughs> so I report technically to Dr. Mosey and the committee physicians, and Dr. Mosey's quite the character, and it's, it's an honor to work with him. He, uh, he has been around research for forever, and uh, he really knows his stuff, and he's so well-connected. So I do think you should get him on at some point. Uh, it for sure would be an interesting episode. A lot of laughs. Working on it. I remember one of the exciting things when we started and when you can actually attend a medical conference in person. Oh, I can't is wait. Is that, you know, going to the conference and, you know, I remember meeting up with, you know, different teams, you know, basically the whole conference would be meeting teams, you know, either one of the pharmaceutical companies, one of the MSLs, you're, you're discussing trials, the whole conference. And it's, it's interesting because I, I wasn't really a part of that in training. I don't think a lot of us were involved in, in that component of, you know, finding trials and finding new protocols. But it is kind of exciting because here we can kind of choose to an extent what trials are best for our patients, right? And, and open those trials, which we think are going to help patients. So you make some interesting points. And in right now, I think I'm um, in community practice we are at an amazing exciting time to be a part of research pharmaceutical companies and i think it it kind of was triggered by covid vaccination research they want diverse patient populations academia hasn't been giving them the diversity that they need Um, so we don't have great data on a lot of uh uh like african-american um Hispanic, Asian, there's a lot of different... The trouble as a clinician is always, yes, you read the results of a study and you go through the protocol and it looks great, but is it applicable to the real world? Right. And so I think what you're alluding to yes. is yes. the real world okay. population is very different than the people who have the means or the ability to travel to a tertiary cancer center. Mm-hmm. Those people are just going to be different people than those who can't travel or don't want to leave home. Think about someone coming who flies to a different state and has the uh, financial ability to stay in a hotel next to a cancer center and live there for who knows weeks if they're getting radiation, coming in every so often and flying in. You know, first of all, you have to be healthy enough to get on an airplane and fly Mm -hmm. and stay somewhere. Second of all, you need to have the financial means to do it. And how many people can do that in in reality, and the answer is a very small number. So I think that's always been a criticism, in my opinion, and I and I've said this forever. Of yeah, that's great, but you don't see those same things when you're actually dealing with real people in front of you. So I think, to your point, Mary Alice, what we can provide is clinical trials and say, is this relevant to the actual people in this country, not just the select few that have the means to get to certain places. So I think pharma, uh, you so eloquently put. And it's exciting because pharma's finally getting there and they're willing to, and I think that uh, in a new exciting trial we opened up this week, they are willing to work with community practice to overcome logistical issues so that they can get this real world data. Um, And so it's a really exciting time to be able to represent a community practice. And just to go off that, I think, you know, some of the academic centers and I talked to some of my friends in Chicago who are a part of some of these centers. And one of the barriers is the the speed between reviewing protocol, getting it approved by the research committee to getting the contract signed and getting it approved and then getting the trial open. At some of these centers, it takes many months to do that. And I feel like we've done a, a really good job so far at reviewing protocols pretty quickly. 
under you know figuring out which which trial we think is worthwhile to pursue and then getting it open pretty quickly not having such a delay in from the time we review it in the research meeting to when it opens up in our practice so i think we're faster at opening up these trials and we have better trials that's it well i think um you know the elephant in the room is cost right and so Mm -hmm. i think if you're you know a lot of these especially from the pharma side medications that are being studied are (laughs) very expensive medications and so if you get something approved and you're costing for patients on Medicare, Medicaid, you know, is taxpayer money, the taxpayer deserves that they should feel confident that if a medication gets approved, it should be applicable to all people, not just a certain segment of the population. So That's I think, a good point. you know, when you have things that can cost, you know, an entire year's salary for one <laughs> dose, mm-hmm. maybe, you know, we should scrutinize that and make sure it actually works in, in the real world. So I think that's where a community practice like us can really, you know, assist in providing some of that information. Well, and then also you have to bring it back. Uh, I think Dr. Uh, Danny talked about the negative data and then also the FDA walking back a couple of approvals. Mm-hmm. So if they, if, and that's where right now I think clinical trials and the design and the patient population are under a high microscope and that's why they're coming to us and they want our involvement um, is because they are getting real world data. So they're having to have these very expensive FDA reviews and then they're losing indications because the trial was you know, fundamentally flawed or once they approve it, they aren't seeing the same in the population that they saw in the trial. Mm-hmm. So it's a really interesting time to and exciting to be um, in the research space, I think. Okay, so <laughs> our mm-hmm. department. Um, so clinical trials can come to CSNF in a multitude of ways. Uh, talked about conferences and networking. Through those connections, we will get protocols. I, I don't even, I don't want to tell you guys how many protocols we're reviewing I for our <laughs> I don't want to next know. month. It's scary. Um, yeah. Well, now that, you know, I feel like we're <laughs> getting emails about protocol, which is great. I, I think it's great that we can try to sift through yes. the, the data, but, um, but yeah, we're getting them from all angles, which is, which is good because hopefully we can pick the most appropriate trials and uh, ultimately, I think the goal is to have a at least one good trial per disease. You know, that would be amazing. So I've been getting a lot of calls from you this week with all those emails and protocols. It's like you know that the committee meetings <laughs> coming it's the up. The podcast, Rick. That's what it is. This, I don't know. No, no other explanation for it. Uh, so this actually, this part, uh, reviewing protocols, it's my favorite part of the process because I love to hear what the physician's take is on and their opinions on the study. There are some very, uh, and it's fun to see everyone voice their opinions differently. Uh, Brenna, you were at our, one of our July and, uh, you got to witness some heated conversations. It was interesting. It was, yeah. It was a good time. I think you have varying degrees of uh, enthusiasm for for studies <laughs> to be kind of PC about. It. I mean, I think you know, there's trials that it's healthy debate. Yeah, it's a healthy it's, debate. I mean, it's I, awesome. It's a casual tumor board. It's it fun. To, it's fun. Yeah. It was fun to watch you guys kind of nerd out about. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, it really just they nerd out like real hard. Well, I think I think the way we decided to is, you know, kind of a majority. If you have a majority agreeing on something and it well, kind you can't, of you can't have through. it all. You can't open every trial. No, you then, can't. I mean, yeah. Everyone is stretched thin and you can't devote the resources you need for that trial. So for sure. It's like herding cats sometimes to get the chime in of majority, what yay kind or of, nay. What kind of cat is Danny? <laughs> He's the silent kind. You have an opinion. Yeah. And you don't, oh, you, and the thing I really like about your approach is you don't speak over people. Sometimes, especially <laughs> when it's, uh, you know, Zoom meetings, it's easy to speak over someone, but you always let the other person finish what they have to say. And then you do have a very spot on opinions and points. And it's really exciting to hear all these different things taken into consideration. I think it's Danny trying to figure out how to turn on the Zoom button. <laughs> is 
is what takes so long for the response. Sometimes I'm muted and I don't realize <laughs> yeah. I'm muted. You're just, uh, yelling, you're just yelling in the phone. No one can hear you. But, uh, yeah, I, you, I digest the information right. and then I come out with my opinion. Danny's the it. cat just laying in the corner chilling and all of a sudden he just whacks you. Well, I usually, watch that. I usually ate way too much lunch and I'm trying to digest that. But then my favorite part is you can hear Dr. Sugarman in the background like yes. yelling her yes. opinion, even though she's also on the call. And so it's, she's seeing it's, patients as she's yelling yes. her opinion. You know, oh, and, and doing a million things. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's fun. That's a fun time. Um, so, though, in this committee meetings, we I think we've gotten really good at vetting, taking into mm -hmm. a lot of, and both of you alluded to it over your last episode, um, What what is the benefit of the trial? What are we studying? Does it serve an unmet clinical need? Uh, also, feasibility. Are we going to be bringing in the patient for biopsies that are not standard of care? I don't know a patient who wants to go have uh, a biopsy right after an infusion. So that's a reason we decide not to go with a recent clinical trial. So there's a lot that we take into account, and it's um, I think we're getting pretty good at vetting. Uh, and then so we have uh, regulatory. Once our committee decides to go yay or nay, our regulatory team works on study startup. Um, I, I think we've gotten pretty efficient with it, uh, three to six months. I would like to see us, and I, I hold my regulatory team accountable to their turnaround time. I'd like to see us be at three months. I think, no, I mean, I think if we could be at three months, that would be exceeding expectation in terms of opening up trials. I, I think a lot of people are beyond that, you know, getting getting some of these trials open. And it's frustrating, too, because you review it at the meeting, <gasps> and, and you you're like, I'm back. so excited about this trial. And then six months later, you're like, eh, we can't open we can't get this patient on the, who we want to get it on the trial. So, but I think we're getting quicker. And um, so, even with quickness, though, we have a, a new avenue for getting trials approved. It's called a uh, just-in-time trials. So, uh, we have a partnership with Tempest, and uh, they help us actually activate a study within about ten days. So, that is an avenue we have for rapid activation um, of a clinical trial when there is a need to get the patient on trial early. So that we've actually done two of those since March um, and those have been really, it's been fun to see how they've streamlined a lot of study startup processes that for us can take a while and there's a lot of back and forth and they're just, it is a lot, it's so efficient. So it's nice to learn from their processes and try to implement it with our team. I think what patients need to know is, you know, these just-in-time trials are tailored for them. We're looking at mm -hmm. patients with a certain mutation, mutation. maybe yes. that has a specific therapy for your type of cancer. So I think it's, it's really amazing that we can personalize the medicine and research to them. Yes. Thank you for adding that because that's a, that's an important thing to remember. It's for a specific the Tempest trials are a lot of times for a very specific point mutation um, or a mutation that has popped up for a patient. So then the trials open and we have our clinical co research coordinators who are screening the patients, looking for potential patients and um, then works with the physicians to try and determine if the patient is a good candidate for the clinical trial. Um, and uh, talked a lot about making sure it is the, um, I know in your last episode, making sure it's the right patient for the right trial. And uh, I think our physicians do an incredible job of really trying to determine if it's the right route for that patient. Um, and so right now we have 33 studies open, uh, which is really exciting. You can check them out at our website. Uh, so Brenna, I will put it in the link. She does an awesome job with keeping our website up to date with all the clinical trials we have open. Thank you. Yeah. Please check it out. Yes. Amazing check that we have that website. many trials open here. You know Brenna's ego now is going to be tough to <laughs> She's not going to fit in the pod loft much just longer. Went through the roof. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're doing a great job. I really appreciate you. I think an important point, too, about these trials is sometimes there's a treatment that we want to give a patient, and it doesn't even have to be a cancer treatment. We have some trials that aren't specifically for cancer treatments, but... Um, mm -hmm. You know, these research studies are usually at no cost to the patient. Of course, they have to be consented and understand what the trial is. But 
you may be able to get a treatment that otherwise costs thousands of dollars and is not easily accessible outside of the trial. So I think that's another huge benefit of research. We're adding to the knowledge and the research component, but we're also, I think, helping patients sometimes with the financial burden. Absolutely. Not to go into too much specifics about the actual clinical trial, but Dr. Rick, do you want to talk about an exciting type of therapy that we're bringing to our patients? Am I allowed to talk about it? Not the actual specifics of the trial. That's why just check out the website, but maybe about the type of therapy? Sure. Yeah, no, I think um, as a radiation oncologist, obviously we're not as heavily involved with pharma on a day-to-day basis like Dr. Kabrinsky and his (laughs) colleagues, but there's a kind of a whole class of um, therapeutics called, the general term is radiopharmaceuticals. So these are usually medications where there's some radioactive component um, linked to a molecule, usually a protein or something along those lines that is specific for certain tumor types, the most famous being probably Zofigo for prostate cancer. But there are many other um, radionucleotides being developed at a very rapid rate here, and I think it really is going to be a pretty big component of cancer treatment in the next decade. I think it's going to probably not be as big a bite of the apple as something like immunotherapy, but I think it's going to be a pretty big bite of the apple because it's a reasonably they are generally reasonably targeted therapies and the burden of side effects are much lower than a traditional chemotherapy because we're really focusing on on targeting specific markers on these tumors so we have a program that has you know been up and running since i've been here and we've added a few um, uh, treatments like lutathera for neuroendocrine tumors so we do that here and we've been doing it since i've you know joined i helped start that program and i'll just say we have a lot of hopefully new things coming down the pipeline for other cancers and please check out the website we're always available for questions you know if you read about a trial somewhere else and you want to know if we do it or maybe there's a trial that you've read about that may be in the pipeline but we are not allowed to talk about yet Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. feel free to you know we're always available to answer questions and mary alice and our team can get back to you and say oh actually we're about to open this Mm -hmm. so um, definitely if you're a patient or a patient family member that has those kind of questions don't ever hesitate to to reach out to us. How many do we have pending right now, Mary Alice? Oh, goodness. Uh, Or roughly? About 10. About 10, yeah. So constantly looking at new trials and Mm -hmm. seeing what we can do, yeah. And I think, and the other thing I think, and I know we said it last episode, but I wanna say it again is, a patient should never feel pressured to be on a clinical trial. So I know right now we're talking about a lot of the the good things about, you know, research in clinical trial medicine, which is, I think, a very, obviously a very good thing. But a patient should never feel like they're being twisted or, you know, being pulled in a certain direction and your doctors and the staff and everyone will love you just the same and treat you just the same whether you're on a clinical trial um, or not. But it's just that we want to make sure that we can provide options for you and you at least have the chance for different options. And in some people, a clinical trial is the wrong choice and that's okay. And there's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't mean you're getting substandard care. It's just you're not on a clinical trial. So it's just something to keep in mind because I feel like sometimes people feel shortchanged or gypped if they can't get on a clinical trial when that the reality is they may not need to be on a clinical trial because there's already a very amazing standard of care that really there's no minimal to no room for improvement. So right. um, I, I think that's just something to keep in mind in that when you meet with your doctor for your specific case, if a clinical trial is not presented or there isn't a clinical trial available, it does not mean things are bad. It's just Mm -hmm. what the reality may be for your situation. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, The only other thing I had was uh, Dr. Danny, if you wanted to talk about anything kind of exciting research going on in leukemia. I know that that space has seen a lot of change um, in CLL. And if there's anything that's exciting that you're interested to see what the data is going to be and where the field is going. Yeah, I think for specifically for CLL, SLL, one of the uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, um, it there's an exciting uh, trend that we're studying very effective oral drugs, which are already FDA approved for, for uh, CLL. And there are some upcoming trials looking at combinations of these oral therapies, which are already available, saying adding a, a to approve therapies together and seeing if it's better than just one. 
And uh, there's also in, in patients who have been on treatment for CLL and say have some progression of their, of their disease, there are some, some trials which are on the horizon here, which uh, we're investigating a new therapy which has a mechanism of action which is known but, but a better therapy uh, and we're adding it to kind of standard of care therapy, which is exciting. You know, I think, again, I think what patients should know is we're, we're not taking away those, those standard treatments, which we know work, but we're trying to make them better. And that's exciting. Yeah. And to actually have data comparing it, because right. a lot of times they don't do head to heads and it's very interesting in CLL that they're starting to do these head to head comparisons. Mm-hmm. And, um, right now, the data is finally becoming mature, so we can actually interpret it, which yeah. is very interesting. It's, you know, it's exciting when you can talk about not having to give a patient chemotherapy, you know, mm-hmm. and that we can give you a therapy that is not as toxic, um, much better tolerated, you know, and uh, you can take at home without necessarily getting an infusion in the clinic. And so when we're doing these trials and adding a new therapy, like Mary Alice said, we're, we're combining it uh, and comparing it to a standard therapy, which, which has been out there for a long time. So yeah, very exciting time. I think for CLLSLO, we have definitely a couple trials in line to be opening up. And these are national, really, really well done trials. Well, thank you so much, Mary Alice, for joining us. We're so happy to have you here and give us all the good information on the research team and how it can help patients. Yeah, that was a pleasure, and I think some good, lively discussions that uh, Brenna probably is going to have to edit out, lest I keep my job here at Cancer Specialists. <laughs> <laughs> well, we always appreciate you joining us for another episode here on Medical Minute. And if you have any suggestions on things we should talk about, questions you'd like answered, or you just want to say hi, please email us at medicalminute at csnf.us. I think you had that memorized, Rick. That's awesome. No, I'm reading off a piece of paper, but we're getting close. And make sure you follow us on social media. Search Cancer Specialists of North Florida on Facebook and underscore CSNF on Twitter and Instagram. And TikTok, the Photoshop of videos. And as always, we appreciate you giving us a few free minutes of your time, and we hope you learned something today. And remember, Rick, when it comes to your health, stay informed. Ask questions. And and tune tune in next next time. time. Rick just flipped the sheet to... To say that last line. <laughs> <I know. laughs> so everybody be aware. He flipped it. <laughs> Listen. Hey.